Okay, so first let's talk about mycosis fungoides, right? This is probably where we should start when we talk about skin lymphomas because MF is a relatively common skin lymphoma as, as skin lymphomas go. And um, it's a, a thing that we encounter that all of you probably have seen patients with it. And if not, you will. And also it's a thing that we're often thinking, well, am I, is it MF or is it not MF? And that's really challenging and, and uh, something I still struggle with on a regular basis. And I think everyone does, honestly. So let's look at some classic examples of what we want to see in mycosis fungoides. This is a really slam dunk example. And what we look at is mycosis fungoides is a T-cell lymphoma. There are other types of T-cell lymphomas in the skin, but MF is, again, the, probably the most well-known and most common form. And what happens is that the, uh, the clonal T lymphocytes, they infiltrate the epidermis, and that's called epidermotropism. And that takes several forms. One of the forms is this, what we can call tagging. The atypical lymphocytes, they're hyperchromatic and a little bit enlarged here, but they don't always look that way. Sometimes I feel that, that mycosis fungoides has relatively small, you know, bland lymphocytes. And if you find it difficult to evaluate lymphocyte atypia, you're in good company because I think unless they're super ugly, I find it really challenging personally to evaluate the atypia. And if you're looking for, you know, cerebriform crinkled nuclei, man, I promise you, I can find some cerebriform nuclei in any skin. <laughs> Give me a biopsy with some lymphocytes on it and I'll find you something that looks cerebriform. So I think it, it's something that is a, if it, it's a skill much beyond my ability personally, um, but what I go on more personally is the architecture usually. And then you combine that, of course, very importantly with the clinical. So I'm not really going to show clinical in this lecture, but that is so crucial is making sure that if I think something looks like mycosis fungoides, it really has to fit and make sense clinically and fit with the history and the appearance. And, um, and so that's why it's often really difficult to make a definitive diagnosis of mycosis fungoides if you, if you don't have a complete story that especially with the, the dermatologist impression and the clinical information. So anyway, back to what we're seeing here is we've got the lymphocytes and they're tagging, they're scattered along, right along the basal layer of the epidermis here. When they do this, they tend to get little vacuoles around them. Sometimes we call those halos. And so this tagging of lymphocytes with halos around them along the basal layer is really helpful. Well, you might say if you're savvy at Dermpath, you know, and you're like, hey, that looks kind of like vacuolar interface dermatitis. You're right. It kind of does. And in fact, there are plenty of times where I think, oh, is that vacuolar interface or is that epidermotropism? Well, one thing that really helps me is that mycosis fungoides usually has a lot of lymphocytes, but not much reactive response from the epidermis. So not much spongiosis and not many dying keratinocytes. I, there are exceptions on both of those things. But in general, when I see too much for too little, too, too much lymphocytic infiltrate and too little inflammatory response like spongiosis or dying keratinocytes, that's when I start suspecting mycosis fungoides. The other thing you're going to see is this, this wiry thickened collagen. And the collagen patterns of the dermis, I think, is a little bit more subtle skill that takes a little while to be able to pick up on. But next time you look at a piece of normal skin, go look at the papillary dermis and look how fine and delicate the collagen is compared to the thick, more you know, chunky bundles of collagen in the reticular dermis. Here, there is no fine collagen. This is dense, wiry collagen that's replacing the papillary dermis. This is a sign of chronicity. This process has been going on for a while. Now, the problem is that other things like chronic spongiotic dermatitis will get fibrotic like this too. And in fact, when I put a biopsy down that, that looks like chronic sponge derm and I see this fibrosis, right away I know the dermatologist probably has mycosis fungoides on their differential diagnosis because the things that make it look chronic microscopically are going to make it look kind of like MF clinically too. So again, this is part of the problem that it can be challenging both clinically and microscopically to sort this out with uh, certainty. And I, I see a little box popping up. I'm not sure if it's a chat, but if you guys have any questions, you can just interrupt me. Uh, if you're waiting for a gap in my speaking, it's never going to happen. So you just interrupt me and I will sit, answer your question and then we'll go back to it. Don't worry. So anyway, the wiry collagen is a helpful sign. The lymphocytes in the epidermis, the tagging, all of that are useful features, okay? So that's mycosis fungoides. And there's the tagging highlighted by CD3, which is a marker of T cells. Basically all normal T cells should be CD3 positive and most T cell lymphomas are gonna be CD3 positive. So that you can see they're just like, you know, completely replacing that basal layer with lymphocytes, okay? Now, here's a more exuberant example. This was probably either like the 
plaque stage or even tumor stage mycosis fungoides, even though those are clinical terms, they do correspond with what we see microscopically. And the reason I'm showing you this one is in addition to the real dense infiltrate down in the dermis, look what's happening up here. We have clusters of atypical lymphocytes making these little pockets in the epidermis. And so those are the classic Pautrier microabscess. Now you don't always see those in mycosis fungoides. And interestingly, if you ignore those, look, there's actually not much tagging. So each case is a little bit different. You know, sometimes you have tagging, sometimes you have Pautrier, sometimes you have both. Sometimes if like, if particularly if the patient's been putting, you know, steroids on it, or maybe they've had, you know, ultraviolet light exposure, sometimes you lose all of the epidermotropism. And those cases can be really, really difficult. So in, in any case here, these are the Pautria microabscesses. And when you look closer, look, you can see they're, they're a nice collection here. Now, you know what that looks like? Those look an awful lot like Langerhans cells to me. And remember that Langerhans cells like to aggregate together and make these kind of pools or nests in the epidermis in spongiotic dermatitis, particularly like, you know, contact dermatitis. We often see that, but other forms of sponge derm also. So the big distinction is if I see something that I think, ooh, I'm not sure if those are Langerhans cells or T cells, Immunostains will easily solve that for you. If those are Langerhans cells, no problem. That could just be, a, it's probably just reactive. If on the other hand, those are T cells, then this is almost certainly gonna be mycosis fungoides, or there are some other forms of lymphoma that can be epidermotropic. So we're not gonna go delve into that in this talk because it is complex. Um, but I do recommend you look, and again, that, that book I talked about at the beginning that Dr. Sudtill wrote um, has really nice tables in there. Here's all the lymphomas that can be epidermotropic, and here's all the ones that can have CD56 expression. It's really, it's really quite, quite useful. So um, any, in any case, those are Pautria microabscesses. And here, this is from a different case, but you can see on this CD3 stain, these are definitely not Langerhans cells, which would be CD3 negative, CD1A positive. These are actually T cells. So um, I, I often, when I'm trying to work up for MF with immunostains, I often include a, a, not only a CD4 and a CD8, because as some of you probably know, most cases of mycosis fungoides tend to be CD4 positive, CD8 negative. That's not always true. Um, there is a CD8 positive form, and occasionally you can even get like double loss and weird stuff like that. But the I don't just do 4 and 8, and the big reason why is guess what? Langerhans cells and other um, cells that are of monocyte or macrophage origin or, or, or lineage, they express CD4. Antigen presenting cells tend to express CD4, including Langerhans cells. So if you do a CD4 alone, you're gonna see a lot of stuff in the epidermis on sponge derm or on anything, and those are Langerhans cells. So what I wanna do is a three plus a four and an eight, and I the, my four plus my eight should match up and explain all the cells I see on CD3. If I've got a population of cells that's highlighting with neither four or eight, that's abnormal, right? If their T cells should have either four or eight, you shouldn't be double positive. They shouldn't be double negative. And if you know if they're all four or all eight, that's abnormal too. Okay, so the interpretation of those stains is is quite challenging, as we'll talk about in a minute. But that's the general basic principle um, uh, to start out with thinking about. And then again, the nuances are way way over my head. Okay, so those are Pautria microabscesses. And here's another case where you can just see really striking epidermotropism. Not only do we have Pautria microabscess, but lots and lots of lymphocytes trickling all the way up into the epidermis here. And these have a bit more cytoplasm than, than you would normally expect in, in uh, lymphocytes, which can be confusing because you could look at those and think, are those melanocytes? Are they Langerhans cells? And again, immunostains will solve that. But um, I have seen cases occasionally where it can be, you know, can trick you at first glance, especially when you're starting out. Now, this is a case of tumor stage mycosis fungoides, and it oftentimes, at least in my experience, I've often seen cases of tumor um, MF that lacked uh, epidermotropism, at least on the portion that I had on the biopsy. So um, you, you certainly can have it, but there, don't be surprised um, to see a case where it's just a sheet of, of lymphocytes filling the dermis and no epidermotropism at all. That happens. Now, in those cases, I could not look at this biopsy here without any information I can look at this and say, this is almost certainly going to be a lymphoma or some other round blue cell thing, even from low power. That's abnormal. The dermis is completely wiped out with just a little bit of collagen left, and it's just filled with blue cells, right? And normally this kind of sheet-like filling goes very well for a lymphoma, but I can't really go beyond that here because even from here, I don't see much. You can see a real nice clean uh, line between the epidermis and the dermis, so that there's not really any... Uh, um, epidermotropism here. So without the history of, oh, this patient has known MF and now they've developed nodules, uh, 
um, or without some other biopsy showing me that, there'd be no way I would know just from this biopsy that it's MF. I could say it's probably lymphoma, but that's that would uh, even you know with stains I could say it's a T cell lymphoma, but I wouldn't be sure it's MF unless I knew the patient had patches and plaques that are pigmented and present for years on the double sun covered areas like the buttock and the trunks, uh, the other way around buttocks and the trunk, um, and then I'm like oh this is probably MF. So again a lot of times on a biopsy I'll say well we have to correlate with what the clinical is. So this is why it's so incredibly important to include the appropriate clinical history in your notes and photographs. Hopefully you guys all know this, but a photograph is worth like 10,000 words. And for me as a pathologist, I can't tell you how many times I've you know started to you know write down my report and think I know what's going on from looking at the slide. And then I see the clinical photo and I'm just like, delete. There's no way it's that. It just doesn't make sense based on that clinical photo. And um, snapping a couple pics and putting it into the chart is so much faster than writing the, you know multiple paragraphs on the requisition sheet. Although I'm fine if you want to do that too. The more history, the better. Uh, but definitely you can really, really help um, with good, good clinical photos can make a huge difference. Okay, so I've harped on that enough. Now, this is the picture we started at the beginning. And wow, look, immunostains are so great, right? It's easy, right? CD3 positive, so it's T cells. And in this, in this section, actually, you can see some potrea microabscesses. Look at that. There are a few there. And they're 100% CD4 positive. There's like only a couple little CD8 positive, which are probably just the background non-neoplastic, non-clonal uh, T cells, like the patient's normal background uh, T cells. And then C, and you can see those same cells are positive on the five and the seven. So those few are the normal and everything else is shows complete CD4. So that's way outside of the normal ratio um, or, or range of, of four to eight. And um, uh, then, which I think is normally around like four to one ish. I, it's not a hard, fast rule. And, and it, I think different people have kind of different views about that. And then look, CD5, which is normally positive in normal T cells, completely lost. CD7, which is positive in normal T cells, although sometimes it gets diminished in reactive processes, totally wiped out. So it's great. This confirms this is a T cell lymphoma that's CD4 positive. But the problem is, is this worked perfectly here, but I already told you on H&E on that last slide, I know right away this is going to be lymphoma. I guess it could be leukemia or, or something else. But, but I mean, I mean, right away, if those are lymphocytes, it's lymphoma. I mean, almost certainly to my eye. I mean, I guess they're very, very rarely could a reactive thing look like that. I don't think I've ever seen reactive uh, lymphocytic thing that dense personally. I'm sure some heme path experts have, but. So the thing about the immunostains is they're great in theory and they're great on, they tend to work the best on cases that are very dramatic and obvious, like big tumor stage processes. The more subtle and early a case is, the more difficult the immunostains are to interpret and the less useful they tend to be, which is really frustrating. The times that we need the stains the most, uh, they tend to work the, the worst. And the same is true, I would say, of PCR to do T cell receptor gene rearrangement. If it's clonal, that can be helpful to support MF, but the problem is reactive things can be clonal sometimes, and occasionally, particularly on really sparse early infiltrates where there's very few T cells present, you can get false negatives because there's just not enough cells present. So again, the really early subtle cases, oftentimes hard to diagnose. Once you've got this big tumor, well, yeah, but I, do I really need to do a PCR here? No, I mean, that's obviously, to me, just on this immunostains, clearly this is T cell lymphoma. I don't see... As a, again, as not a heme bath expert, I don't see any way this could be anything else. So, um, so that's been the frustrations in practice. So I think some things that I've thought about from what I've picked up over the years is, you know, the early subtle cases, it, it's very common for early subtle MF to get misdiagnosed, not even once, but several times on biopsy as, you know, nonspecific, you know, infiltrate or mild sponge derm or chronic chronic sponge derm. And that's that's um, a really normal thing. And that's nothing to do with the skill of the person looking at the biopsy usually. It's just the fact that it's really difficult in early cases. And I, I volunteer um, a bit in a patient, uh, Mycosis Mongoides patient group on Facebook. And from time to time, I'll answer some questions there, but I mostly kind of observe. But I, I've mentioned there before to them that this is really normal and that, that oftentimes patients require several biopsies over years to definitively to establish a diagnosis of mycosis fungoides. So when I see a biopsy that I'm pretty sure is just chronic sponge derm, but they're clinically concerned for MF and, you know, there's a little bit of some, you know, a couple cells in the epidermis. A lot of times I'll say, I don't favor MF on this biopsy, but I would recommend follow-up. And if this process persists, uh, then repeat biopsies over time may be helpful to, to further evaluate for that. So I really do think that's important. And that's important if you have MF in your 
suspicion to help the patients understand that, you know, on this biopsy, we think it's probably just a, an inflammatory eruption, but, you know, sometimes MF can look like that. So we want to keep an eye on you and keep following you. We may need to biopsy you again over time if this doesn't get better. Let's just see. So there you go. So let's talk about a, a little bit of variation. So here's another one where you've got a dense infiltrate in the dermis. But look, there's also infiltrate around the eccrine coils down here. Um, and up here, there's a potrium microabscess. There's another one. This is that, the area I showed you a couple slides back. But look what's happening. This, this follicle is totally expanded. This hair follicle is expanded by uh, lymphocytes. And you can see closer there, there's basically like potrium microabscesses and tagging in the epithelium of the follicle. So this is called folliculotropic mycosis fungoides. Some patients have this just in the follicles without any of the epidermal involvement. Sometimes you have both, like in this particular case. Um, and this form can be harder to treat. And I believe some studies at least have shown that it, it can have a more aggressive clinical course. Um, uh, and it's probably part of why it's more difficult. It's deeper down, right? So the, a lot of the topical things we apply are gonna have a harder time reaching down to those follicles. All right, and here's uh, another case of folliculotropic MF, and this one came with expansion of the follicles, and they're filled with blue mucin, and so this is called follicular mucinosis, which oftentimes, but not always, it goes uh, along with mycosis fungoides, either regular MF or folliculotropic MF, and sometimes you can have mu follicular mucinosis without mycosis fungoides, either as a reactive phenomenon or an idiopathic finding. I think there's a little controversy. Not everyone uh, agrees with that. Some people believe that all follicular mucinosis is MF, but um, I'm not. I, I personally, I think that there are some cases that don't seem to ever go on to progress to to MF or behave like MF. So it seems to me like some cases um, are are actually just mucinosis. Distinguishing when there's a dense infiltrate of lymphocytes getting into the follicle, then then it's relatively easy to say, oh, it's MF. But the, the problem is, is that sometimes you can have lymphocytes with follicular mucinosis. Sometimes you can have clonality in follicular mucinosis. So the distinction um, in some cases between whether it's just mucinosis or mucinosis plus MF can actually be pretty challenging. So, and um, I've been told that there's actually some forms of, of LYP that can kind of mimic this follicular tropic MF pattern. I don't believe I've seen one of those yet in practice, but uh, uh, LYP is lymphomatoid papulosis we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and if you haven't paid attention, there's a growing list of things that seem to be weird variants of lymphomatoid papulosis that are there to vex and confuse pathologists. And there's a closer look up at the follicular mucinosis.